Our next chapter is about mineral resources and mineral reserves, their definitions and factors influencing resources and reserves. After the discovery of a mineral prospect through exploration drilling, more denser drilling is conducted to establish the grade, the size and the shape of the mineral resource in the ground. The mineral resource can afterwards be converted to a mineral reserve in the course of a feasibility study of the whole project. The definition of reserves and resources is according to industry best practice standards. There are several classification schemes worldwide and the following will be treated. The National Instrument 43101 from the Canadian Institute of Mining and the JOG, the Joint Ore Resources Code from Australia, which are both best practice professional judgment of competent persons. And the UN Code, which is mostly used from governments. A mineral resource is defined as a concentration of material in the ground with potentials for an eventual economic extraction. According to the increasing geological knowledge, the mineral resource is subdivided in the following categories. Inferred resource with the lowest knowledge, indicated and measured with the highest knowledge about the geological body in the ground. The reason if a mineral resource can be called measured or still has to be called inferred depends on errors and confidence levels. An inferred resource, for example, is defined as a geological evidence that is indicated by tonnage and or great continuity and an inferred resource may not be used for an economic study. The error is plus minus 50% and the confidence level is 90%. An indicated resource has a far lower error of only 20% and wide-spaced sample locations give a reasonable indication of continuity used in economic studies. The highest knowledge of a mineral resource is given by a measured resource which has narrow-spaced sample locations which allow a clear determination of the shape, size, density of the ore, the grade and this may also be used in economic studies. The error is only plus minus 10%. The classification into the categories inferred, indicated and measured is based on drill hole spacing. Here on this example you can see the drill hole spacing of an inferred, an indicated and measured category of a mineral resource. The closer the drill hole spacing the higher is the knowledge about the mineral resource in the ground. But we are not able uh, to give a general description about the drill hole spacing. For example, you cannot say uh, when I have a drill hole spacing of 50 times 50 meters, I can call my uh, deposit uh, as a measured resource, for example. This is not possible because there are uh, very uh, huge differences uh, between uh, different types of deposit as you can see here on this on the sketch uh, on the uh, left below uh, you can see uh, deposits with a high homogeneity and a high proportion of all minerals this is particularly the case for evaporites and coal beds these deposits can stretch over a very large area without changes in grade and uh, thickness. So if you know that, then uh, you are allowed to use uh, 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 higher distances between uh, the different, the neighboring uh, drill holes and you are still allowed uh, to call uh, a resource, for example, a measured resource. Uh, on the other hand side, you can have uh, very complex uh, deposits like gold veins, for example, and these veins uh, have high uh, variability in grade and thickness. And because of this, you cannot 
uh, predict uh, the grade from one drill hole to the other if the spacing, uh, if the distance is too uh, is too high. So you you will have to have a far uh, more narrow spacing uh, to be allowed to call a resource measured. And how this is uh, done and how the spacing is, I will uh, show on the next slide. This difference in complexity is defined by the coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation divided by the mean value times 100 to get the coefficient of variation in percent. When this coefficient is below 20, we are talking about a very regular deposit. It's usually stratiform deposits like iron ore, coal or salt. And the average sample, sample number for 1 million tons of ore is 20 to 30. And the distance of drill holes can be higher than 100 meters. We're talking about a regular deposit when the coefficient of variation is between 20 or 40. This is usually sedimentary, accelerative, lead zinc deposits, sediment hosted, stratiform copper, porphyry copper, and similar deposit. The average sample number for 1 million tons of ore is 70 to 100, and the distance of drill holes is already far closer. It's only 20 to 50 meters. Irregular deposits, we are talking about when the coefficient of variation is between 40 and 80. This can be vein deposits or magmatic uh, chromium nickel copper deposits. The average sample number for 1 million tons of ore is 200 to 300 and the distance of the drill holes is only 10 to 30 meters. And we do have very irregular, irregular deposits when the coefficient of variation is between 80 and 100. This can be the case for some gold veins, for pegmatites, and also for gold and tin or diamond places. We have a very, very high number of samples that are needed to define 1 million tons of ore. This is 600 to 900, and the distance of the drill holes can, do not have to be, but can be below 10 meters. Similar to mineral resources, there is also a subdivision of mineral reserves into probable and proved. A probable reserve, reserve is the extractable part of an indicated mineral resource. The error is plus minus 20% and the confidence level 90%. And a proved reserve is the economically extractable part of a measured mineral resource with an error of plus minus 10% and a confidence level of also 90%. Here you can see the relation between mineral resources and mineral reserves. From inferred to indicated to measure, there is an increasing level of geological knowledge and confidence. The same is from probable to proved, increasing level of geological knowledge. On the other hand side, from left resource to right reserve, there is a consideration of mining, metallurgical, economic, marketing, legal, environmental, social and governmental factors, the so-called modifying factors. And because of all these factors that are integrated into a feasibility study, usually only between 80 and 40 percent of a mineral resource can be transferred to a reserve. The rest is, at least at the moment, not economically extractable. A mineral reserve is the economically extractable part of a mineral resource. This has to be established by at least a pre-feasibility study, but usually a feasibility study, demonstrating through adequate information on metal price, ore value, mining and processing costs, that currently a viable extraction is possible. A feasibility also includes detailed information about the environment and social impacts. Reserves consider mining dilution and losses as well as the recovery of the milling process. According to increasing geological knowledge, mineral reserves are subdivided into probable and proved mineral reserves, with proved 
having more detailed geological information compared to probable. On this slide you can see the increasing knowledge about the geological body, about the mineral resource project that is in the beginning when it's about literature study, desktop work relatively low. It's also relatively low when you start your geological campaigns, your geophysical surveys, until you define a drill target and probably have a first intersect of the mineral deposit, the discovery. The knowledge starts to increase when the first mineral resource estimation has been done and it increases further when the pre-feasibility study is completed, which includes the mining method, the approximate size of the processing facility and also first studies about environment and social uh, circumstances are included. These studies and also processing uh, recovery methods, um, all the detailed engineering work is then included in the feasibility study which has to prove if your mining project is feasible, economically feasible, to be mined. After the feasibility study has been completed with a positive result, the project construction can start when financing is also approved. When all these steps have been fulfilled, the project can be uh, commissioned and the mining can start. This slide gives an overview about geographical factors influencing mining projects. One is infrastructure. Are there borders that have to be crossed? What about the transport ways and the connection? Are there settlements? Do I have access to energy and water supply? And is there workforce av available? What about the supply of working stocks? Next is the transport situation, the distance of the deposit from the sales market. Especially important here uh, is the type of transport, seaborne, rail bound or road traffic. Road transport can be quite cost intensive, especially for long distances. What about the transport tariffs and the transport quantities? The next point is the ecological situation or in this case more the climate situation. What about the temperatures, the precipitation, the topography which has an influence on the transport and but also on the in uh, in open pit mining on the waste to ore ratio. Is there groundwater? Probably too much groundwater that has to be pumped away. What about geo risks? What about the general environmental situation? Next point are economic geography and socio-economic situation in the, in the country. Is it embedded in the regional and national economy? Again, workforce, availability, competence and status of vocational formation are important factors for the project. The environment and the environment protection are of more and more importance to mining projects. Is the sensitivity of the region, is there something that deserves protection or is there a protected area? Compet competing land uses are also severe, can be a severe problem, especially with a socio-economic impact. Is there agriculture or forestry? Are there settlements? Is there tourism, which gives employment to the people in the surrounding area? And last but not least, the juridical, fiscal and legal uh, situation in the country, in the region, are of high importance to a mining project. What about the mining and subsoil law, the corporate law, working and social laws, environmental law, trade and tax law? How much royalties do I have to pay? The project approval procedures are important things that have to be mentioned or thought about during the project development and the fiscalization also important. The fiscal and financial resource political conditions. What about the exchange rate, the profit transfer from the project to another country and the money market in general in the country that might influence the project finances. And the legal predictability and political stability are very important factors when it comes to mineral economics because the more stable and the more predictable a country is, 
the lower are usually the rates that have, have to be paid to the banks and the, the and the legal predictability has a direct influence about the discount rate that directly influences the net present value calculation. But there are of course not only geographical factors but also geological factors influencing the workability of an ore body. There are two attributes modifying uh, the ore body. One is the product modifying attributes and the other are production modifying attributes. The product modifying attributes are the kind and the quality of the ore with respect to the end product and also the grade which both have a direct influence on the quality of the ore and they together make the attributes of the ore together with the processability. Production modifying attributes are processability, exploitability and tonnage. The processability and the exploitability together with the grade are directly related to the excellence of the deposit, the bonity and the quality. And the tonnage defines the quantity of the deposit, of the reserves and the resources and also of the processing facility. The more tonnage, the bigger the processing and the cheaper the unit costs for the processing. And the processability, the exploitability, the tonnage and the grade define the excellence of the deposit, the quantity of the deposit and together make the attributes of the ore body. The kind and the quality of the deposit substance with respect to the end product from the slide before is mentioned here again with more details because a lot of factors, geological factors from the material influence the kind and the quality of the deposit. This can for instance, be the wideness for fillers, the particle size distribution, briquetting properties, viscosity in case of crude oil, the hardness, especially for iron ore, probable byproducts with value, or on the other hand side, harmful substan substances that are price reducing. And for coal, it's about the cooking properties and the caloric value. And most important of all uh, is the product grade. If you have a high grade, you usually, usually have a good quality ore. The next topic is the cutoff grade. It sounds simple, but that's how the definition of a reserve is. It has to be extracted economically. That means the price, the grade, times the recovery has to be higher than the total operating costs. On the right hand side you can see the costs per unit and the ore grade. The lower the ore grade, the higher are the unit costs to extract a certain amount of, let's say, copper, one pound of copper. The lower the, the ore grade, the higher the costs. And the higher the ore grade, the lower the unit costs. That means you need a certain grade as a minimum grade when the unit costs are lower than the operating costs. And this point, this grade, is called the cutoff grade. By applying a cutoff grade to the resource or reserve, the average grade and the total tonnage of the resulting mineral reserve is changing. The average grade will increase and the total tonnage will decrease. The cutoff grade can be calculated by total costs in US dollars per ton divided by the metal price, also in US dollars per ton, times the mill recovery, times the recovery of the deposit that is given by 1 minus the dilution. What you can see here uh, on the top is a block model of a gold deposit of 1 million tons of ore with an average grade of 3.2 grams per ton with a pink and a yellow color indicating higher grades and uh, red medium grades and green uh, lower grades. And the distribution of the blocks uh, is shown on the uh, diagram below where you can see that the majority uh, of the blocks has a grade of 2.5 to 3.5 
uh, grams per ton. 30% of all blocks have an average grade of uh, 3 grams per ton, 20% 2.5 and almost 15 have an average grade of 3.5 grams per ton. There are also some blocks that have far higher grades and also some uh, that go uh, down up to 1 grams per ton, which is the cutoff grade. The same information from the slide before is translated in this uh, diagram. In red you can see the cumulative tonnage, uh, which is 100% if you apply a cutoff grade of 1 grams per ton. If you are now increasing the cutoff grade, you will decrease the tonnage, the residual tonnage you have, because more blocks are considered waste. So by increasing the cutoff grade you uh, also increase the average grade, but on the other hand side you will uh, reduce uh, the tonnage you can mine, and this is especially the case uh, for the blocks where you have uh, uh, grades between 2 and 4 grams. So by increasing the cutoff grade, you will automatically uh, decrease the tonnage of your um, deposit and if you do it extensively, uh, you will destroy uh, your deposit and have a negative uh, influence on the net present value, but we will come to that later on. Here are some examples of how to calculate uh, the cutoff grade. Uh, in this case, there is a copper resource or reserve averaging 2.3% of copper. Uh, the metal price is 2.50 US dollars per pound of copper and the recovery is 80% and mining dilution is 10% and the total costs are 70 US dollars. As you can see now, there are not so many variables for you during this process. A recovery can be improved by certain amount, 80% seems like a good average, but probably you can increase it to 85%. The mining dilution of 10% is standard for, for open pit mining and unfortunately we do not have an influence on uh, the copper price. But you can try to reduce, for example, uh, your mining and processing costs as far as possible because if you can decrease the costs you will also decrease the cutoff grade and that means you can mine a higher tonnage, have a bigger deposit and can extract more value. Additionally, a bigger resource allows you to apply a bigger processing facility which will additionally decrease your costs. Another example of how to calculate a cutoff grade is given, given in the second example with gold. In this case you can uh, use the gold price and you have to divide it by 31.1 so by one ounce and um, mining costs of 60 US dollars and a gold price of 1500 dollars will lead to a cutoff grade of around 1.7. On the above uh, mentioned equation with a cutoff grade for copper, you use the copper price in dollars per pound and have to multiply this by 22, uh, by 22 because this is the conversion of pound to ton because you do not want uh, a pound at the end but you want a percentage. Here's a little exercise for you. What is the cutoff grade for a zinc deposit with an average grade of 8% of zinc? The metal price is 0.9 US dollars per pound of zinc. The recovery is 85% and the mining dilution is 10%. And the total mining and processing costs are 110 US dollars per ton. You now have to apply the equation from the example above. And by doing this, you will result in a cutoff grade of 7.2% of zinc. During exploration, frequently uh, intersects of gold or also other metals like copper um, are reported. And uh, this is an example from the Mirador uh, gold project in Canada. 
Um, on the top you can see uh, relatively uh, short intervals of 1 to 9.5 meters with uh, relatively high grades and on the lower uh, part of the slide you see uh, larger intersects up to 31 meters with uh, still high but not that yeah, pronounced uh, uh, values as can, seem, uh, can be seen above. Uh, in gold exploration is uh, the nugget effect. So there can be pockets with very, very high uh, uh, grades and when you are now uh, drilling and you hit such a pocket, you have, an, uh, you have a very high uh, gold grade, like for example this one meter intersect with 559 grams per ton. But most probably uh, the gold grade will not be that high uh, for the complete block that you are mining later on and you have to translate uh, these uh, intersects you are producing during drilling uh, later on into a block model and you cannot be sure or it's most probably not the case that this high gold grade will be found in the complete block and this is why these unusual high gold grades should be kept for example to one ounce so 31 grams and these 31 grams are then used uh, during the calculation and the production of the block model. Otherwise uh, you would overestimate uh, the gold grade uh, of the complete deposit but especially for, for, for some blocks uh, you are uh, mining later on and so, so you will have an apparent high grade that you will not find during mining. Another important point uh, during exploration and the reporting of intersects is the true width that is uh, mentioned on the bottom right. Uh, what is true width, in this case 80%, uh, I will discuss uh, with you later on. When grades and tonnages are reported from a drilling program for gold projects in this case, uh, not only the intersect width and the gold grade should be mentioned, there are further details that are uh, also important. Uh, one of these details is, for example, uh, in which depth this intersect occurred. Uh, in the example on the top, MD13-05, the intersect is uh, very shallow. It's only 10 meters uh, deep. That means this uh, part of the deposit is suitable for open pit mining whereas uh, the intersect below is uh, uh, further down. It's from uh, 101 meters to 123 uh, meters. So still uh, possible for open pit mining, but uh, if you don't have gold above, you will have a very high waste to ore ratio, for example. So these are also very important uh, figures that should be mentioned. Additionally, you can see the azimuth and the dip of uh, of the drill holes uh, on the bottom of the slide and the complete uh, meters that are reported and also additionally in which uh, goals or exploration zone you are. These are all uh, important figures that should be kept in mind. Additionally here the, the grade is also cut at a certain uh, amount of gold and you uh, get the cut grades and the uncut grades Additionally, so this is the information you you need. It's not only about the intersect and the grade, but it's also about the depth and the drilling direction, the cut grade and the uncut grade, and uh, one other additional information that is also important is the true width I already mentioned, but I will explain that in a slide further down. In this statement. Uh, the gold explorer ore finders is as an example uh, that uh, published the data shown above uh, gives an interpretation of the data uh, we just talked about and they think you can read it on your own I will not read it out here uh, they think that there is a real high grade they call it bonanza grade area uh, at the top of the of the project and Yes, it is possible, but by just one intercept, you cannot say that is really there. You have to really test it uh, with more uh, detail. And uh, as we talked uh, in the beginning, uh, 
these gold vein deposits are highly complex and you have a very low continuity of of grades and that means one intersect can be very high but you have to confirm this by further drilling with a low spacing of the drilling uh, drilling spots drilling areas and only if you have done that you can really confirm that there's a high grade zone and that there's really a lot of gold close to the surface what would, would make the area highly attractive for investors. I want to point out that I'm not doing a commercial or advertisement for this for the company but it's just an example uh, about how uh, data should be analyzed and uh, reports should be made. It's really well done here. You have an old mining area that means it's prospective anyhow and uh, they just keep uh, continuing uh, on uh, on the old trends that were uh, uh, dr uh, drilled and uh, already exploited in open pits before. Uh, they obviously did a literature study before and they thought this could be prospective and then they started their geochemical assays, their mapping, uh, interpreted the, the structures and then tested the structures by drilling and they did do some 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 good intercepts and they uh, also show uh, the veins and the intersects uh, on the next slide on this cross section you can see the old open pit and the old shaft uh, from which uh, underground and open pit mining uh, were done uh, you can see the veins that are open at depth and they reported also uh, open at strike this is very encouraging because it uh, gives more potential uh, to the deposit but you can also see uh, that uh, the, the the veins are relatively irregular you have you can have some veins at the surface but they disappear to the depth so this also shows that there's a very low continuity and the the, the veins may continue to the to the depth and they may continue on strike but this is not uh, necessarily the case they can disappear very quickly this of course has to be tested but only by hitting a high grade this does not give you any yeah it gives you a hint that there is a potential but it does not demonstrate that you really found an excellent deposit you have to confirm this by drilling and drilling is of course um, prepared by uh, interpret interpreting structures by geological mapping by geochemical hints uh, from from soil uh, anomalies but at the end of the day you have to drill and you have to prove that there really is something in the ground on strike and at depth I already talked about the true width, the true thickness of a drill intersect and here's an example of what that means. You see an ore body, you see a vein that is dipping relatively uh, steep with the angle of beta and you see a drill uh, intersect in this vein. Uh, now the thing is um, you only get the true width if you drill perpendicular to the to the vein you should always try to do that but it's not always possible so in this case uh, the angle of the drill hole alpha is uh, 45 degree so it should be 20 but it is 45 as the ore body is uh, dipping relatively steep uh, you do not would not reach uh, the depth by uh, drilling with an angle of only uh, 20 degree and because of this uh, your intersect is longer than the true width of the ore body as you can see uh, on the sketch on the on the right hand side so you have to do a correction and uh, this correction uh, is done by uh, using the formula uh, above and in this particular case uh, the correction factor would be 0 0.9 so if you have an intersect of one meter you would have to correct this intersect to only 91 centimeters here you can see what is happening 
to the to the true thickness of a drill intersect if you're drilling oblique to the strike. So you do not only have the problem that you're not perpendicular to the structure you are drilling through, but additionally uh, you are you are drilling oblique. On this slide on the top you can see uh, on the very top uh, you see a cross section uh, from A to C uh, with the ore body uh, dipping again relatively steep. And below you can see a projection of uh, the structure of the, of the of the vein and you can again see the uh, A to C in the line and in this direction the drill hole uh, should be uh, carried out but uh, sometimes for technical reasons it's not possible so in this case uh, the color of the drill hole was AB so far away from the uh, from the AC line and as the drill color was from A to B we did drill perpendicular through the structure and this by far increases the intersect so in this case a very huge correction has to be done to avoid misinterpretation of the structure, of the data, of the thickness of the ore body. And the correction uh, is done by uh, applying your geological uh, knowledge with a plan you can uh, see uh, on this slide and the correction uh, factor is then sinus alpha plus delta divided by cosinus delta times cosinus uh, beta. This is the correction factor. Uh, you have to multiply uh, with LD, so the apparent uh, thickness. Sounds very technical. Uh, yeah, kind of is uh, technical, but uh, it is fundamental to do the correction in in this case. Otherwise, you would overestimate uh, the thickness by factor I don't know two, three, or something like this. But there's more you need to know about the ore body than just uh, grade and tonnage. Uh, there are more indicators of the processability of the ore, for example. So one thing is the intergrowth of mineral particles. The stronger they are intergrown, the finer you have to mill and the more difficult it is uh, to separate the mineral particles afterwards in order to produce a concentrate, for example. One thing is also the consistency of the grade yeah, in their processing uh, plant, uh, the metallurgists want a consistent grade uh, during uh, the processing in order to uh, have the best recovery. Grade variations go to the same uh, direction like the consistency of grade, uh, but a high grade zone uh, in the beginning of the uh, mining process can be advantageous uh, in order to uh, create a high cash flow in the beginning. Other factors that are of importance for the technical processability are the diminution behavior of the ore to the host rock and other physical and chemical properties of the ore and also of the host rock. Because on the cost side you have uh, the reverse of the resistance against processing to final products and also on the, on the bad side of the cost side is deleterious substances which are cost increasing. On the revenue side, you have other uh, obstacles like the grade in the final product should of course be as high as possible and deleterious substances which are revenue reducing. You should try to uh, avoid getting these deleterious substances into your final product. In some cases, you cannot avoid this because these deleterious substances are in the crystal lattice, for example, of, of copper minerals, and you uh, need the copper minerals for, for the grade in the concentrate. So you also will also process and enrich the deleterious substances. And this can make um, a project not viable because arsenic, cadmium or other substances uh, are in the final concentrate and the grade is too high, so it's not uh, processable in a in the in the smelting pr uh, process later on but it's not only about the processability it's also about the exploitability of the deposit and that means the geometry and the position in the earth crust uh, which defines the resistance to mining 
form and type uh, are important to to know because they decide which mining method and which working system you can apply. The accessibility, meaning the depth uh, of the deposit, defines if you have need a tunnel added, a ramp or a shaft, if you can apply open pit or underground mining. The thickness of the deposit is of importance to the mining method and the working system, which on the other hand side are uh, define the costs for stove preparation, mining and planning losses. The degree of geological disturbance of the deposit is also important for the mining method and for mining and planning losses of the deposit, so you will have to leave something of the deposit in the ground. The distance between single ore bodies is important to development and preparation costs and also uh, costs for m not only mining but trucking the material to the processing plant. The strength of the ore and adjoining rock is important for mining methods that can be applied, the working system and the rock support and the equipment you need. And the deviation of ore grades also influences mining uh, methods but also if you have a high deviation, you will have high mining and planning losses. Key factors for the decision on open pit mining and underground mining are the mentioned factors above. They will You will decide if you have added ramp or shaft access, which mining method will you apply. Working system, is it work of freeing, blasting and mechanical force? What? How much energy do you need to free the ore? Which, which transport? can you apply and what about rock breaking during the processing? Indicators for decision taking are for example the waste to ore ratio, so not only the average waste to ore but also the marginal waste to ore ratio, the waste cover to thickness ratio which is the stripping ratio especially for coal mines applied, the development work to ore ratio or the store preparation work to ore ratio. Other important factors are for example the ore to waste cutoffs and the average cutoff, the operational cutoff and the processing cutoff and the rock strength. Here are some examples for the exploitability of deposits. On the left hand side you see seam uh, type deposits, on the one hand flat lying, so quite suitable for a room and pillar mining and on the other hand side uh, an inclined uh, seam which is more difficult or more cost intensive to mining. In the middle you can see a massive ore type which you could probably which is probably exploitable by caving methods with a high tonnage and very low costs. The last example uh, for underground mining methods on the on the left hand side are these veins or ore shoots as it's uh, written on the on the sketch. Uh, the one vein would be suitable for open pit mining uh, first, but uh, when it comes to a certain depth, uh, the waste to ore ratio is too high, so the costs for open pit mining are too high, and then uh, there needs to be a change for um, underground mining method, uh, and these mining methods then depend on the thickness of, th of the vein, whether you can um, apply caving methods, um, or uh, if you have to uh, apply cut and fill mining which is uh, more cost intensive. With three outlines of an open pit, so first uh, the first uh, open pit would be A, then it would be extended to B and finally to C. This deposit will have an average waste to ore ratio, but it will also have a marginal waste to ore ratio. What does it mean? Uh, the average waste to ore ratio is uh, defined on the whole deposit, uh, but when you start mining the the outline of uh, open pit A, the waste to ore ratio will be far lower than during the extension to the open pit with the shape B, and on the shape C will be the marginal waste to ore ratio, uh, which is far higher, meaning you will have far higher costs to mine the final ore compared to the outline uh, of A. For the cash flow of the deposit it's of course advantages if you uh, mine uh, the ore with the lowest waste to ore ratio in order to create 
a high positive cash flow in the beginning of the mining project. On the right hand side is an example of a disseminated uh, deposit uh, which would be suitable to open pit mining uh, according to the location in the earth crust. Uh, and you see three uh, outlines of the pit A, B and C and of course uh, mining would start with, uh, with a pit outline A because the waste to all ratio is relatively low here uh, and when this part uh, of the deposit is mined out then the uh, open pit would uh, be extended to the outline B with a higher waste to all ratio and then finally C uh, which has the highest waste to ore uh, ratio. The higher the waste to ore ratio is, the higher are the costs for mining. So uh, at a certain waste to ore ratio, uh, open pit mining becomes uh, uneconomic and this depends first of all on the waste to ore ratio and of course also depends on the ore value. The exploitability of a deposit is also defined by rock mechanical properties like the rock and the rock mass, the properties like strength and abrasiveness, and rock mass properties like failure of rock mass, elastic and plastic behavior, but also failure, for example rock burst, slope slide and pillar failure, and faults and discontinuities. This is not only important for underground mines, uh, where rock slides or, or pillar failures are of particular importance, but also for open pits. Uh, the more compact and uh, the stronger your rock is, the steeper you can uh, develop the open pit, and which reduces uh, the waste to ore ratio. And in underground mining, it defines the costs for the preparation of stopes and edits. So the optimum would be a very competent, a very strong horse rock, but the ore should also be at the same time easily exploitable. This is usually not the case in the nature, but uh, I just want to show you that problems may occur if you have uh, issues with uh, rock mass properties or rock pressure or faults and discontinuities. Other factors. Um, affecting the technical and the feasibility of a deposit are, for example, the hydrogeological situation, the drainage and dewatering. Uh, is there a possibility that you have storm uh, weather events that could flood the open pit? Or is there a lot of um, groundwater in the area so you will have uh, high cost for dewatering your underground operation? What about safety relevant geochemical and mineralogical situation like is there gas available uh, that uh, has to be removed? Is there poisonous gas so special uh, measures have to be taken to protect the workers or is there radiation for example? What is the geothermal uh, condition, the rock temperature, the rock temperature gradient and the climate especially for underground mining? Uh, you should keep the temperatures uh, as low as possible because this is advantageous uh, for the equipment and especially for the workers that are in the ground, underground. And there can be other anomalies like the deviation of uh, properties of the rock and also of the grades. As I mentioned before, the nugget effect can be of particular importance, especially for gold exploration and this so the deviation of properties of the rock and of the grades may influence the performance of the production work which of course influences the economies of the project. There are several classification schemes for mineral resources and reserves in place. In the western world the industry classification is mostly according to the general standards of the National Instrument 43101 of the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum or the Australian Joint Ore Reserves Committee Code, the JOG Code. There are more, for example the, the SAMREC of South Africa, uh, 
uh, but the most important are uh, the National Instrument 43101 or the JAW code. Uh, the National Instrument 43101 requires substantially more technical disclosure to the market than the equivalent JAW code. The JAW code is a code for reporting the status of a mineral resource where the National Instrument 43101 is a code of securities disclosure. The main principles governing the application of the Canadian or the Australian schemes are transparency, materiality and competence. Whereas transparency means that the public report provides sufficient, clear and unambiguous information to understand the report and is not misled. Materiality means that the public reports contains all the relevant information which investors would require or do require for a reasoned, balanced judgment regarding the exploration results, the mineral reserves and the mineral resources. And the competence means that the public report has to be based on the work of a suitable and qualified and experienced person who is subject to an enforceable professional code of ethics. So not only selected information has to be incorporated to the report, but all relevant information. And the report has to be based on a person who is suitable. And suitable means who has experience in the exploration of a deposit that is described in the report. And that also includes that someone who did exploration in coal deposits is of course not uh, a suitable person uh, for vein type gold deposit this is not qualified this is not qualified and this is not possible this is forbidden during the different development stages from preliminary economic assessment to pre feasibility and feasibility studies uh, usually the the resources measured indicated or inferred uh, are further developed to uh, probable and at the end proved reserves. During the preliminary economic assessment you only have resources because, because it has not yet been proven that the minerals in the ground are economically extractable. So you measured, indicated and inferred resources are used for the preliminary economic assessment and then when the project is further developed to a pre-feasibility study, some parts of the resource uh, may be transferred to probable reserves. Uh, measured and indicated resources can also be included into a pre-feasibility study. Inferred resources must not be taken. And then when the project is further developed by a feasibility study, the extractable resources are transferred to probable and proved reserves. And this is of course not the whole resources, but only a part of the, only the extractable part of the resources is transferred during the feasibility study to proved or probable reserve. Another classification scheme apart from the Canadian, Australian or South African standard is the UN classification scheme. So the United Nations Framework Classification, UNFC, for energy and mineral resources is a universally applicable scheme for classifying or evaluating energy and mineral resources and reserves. The classification is designed to allow the incorporation of currently existing terms and definitions into this framework and thus to make them comparable and compatible. The Canadian and Australian schemes have been incorporated in the UN scheme. The classification uses three-digit codes indicating the essential characteristics of extractable energy and mineral commodities in market economies. In this chart you can see something about the first and the last figure of the three-digit code. Uh, the first figure uh, is about the feasibility of the extraction. So on the bottom left you see uh, three 
three one, meaning uh, the the deposit is explored, readily explored. That defines the one at the end, but uh, and the first uh, figure is a three. That means it has not been shown that it's also uh, economically uh, feasible to extract it. If you move up, you have two two one. One does not change because uh, the detailed exploration has been done. Uh, the first uh, figure sh uh, changes to two, meaning that it is eventually extractable. And when you move further up, uh, then you have a one. That means the feasibility study has proven that this deposit is economically extractable. The figure in the middle that changes from three to two to one shows the social impact, which is not evaluated here or shown in this uh, two-dimensional chart. The last figure, which uh, is a one on the left-hand side, is a four on the right-hand side. So on the, on the bottom right, you have only a reconnaissance, so you have no really idea about the uh, tonnage and the grade of the deposit. There's something in the ground, but how much, it's not sure. During prospecting, it changes to three, and when you start general exploration, it turns to two, and then detailed exploration, it's a one. And for uh, an extractable uh, deposit, you need the figure one one one, or at least two one one, to uh, uh, yeah, to be sure that you can exploit uh, the deposit. So a feasibility will turn out in the figures uh, one 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 or. At least the visibility shows that it is feasible to mine the deposit. Uh, here you can also see a translation from the UN code uh, to the Canadian and Australian standards. Uh, during the regional uh, study, you have the code, the UN code 334, which is not equivalent to a Canadian or Australian standard because it's the the knowledge is not sufficient to identify something. You at least need a geological study to have a, a resource, and a resource uh, measured, indicated, or inferred uh, has a three at the first uh, number, and uh, depending on measured, indicated, or inferred, a one, a two, or a three at the last figure. When you have uh, fulfilled a pre-feasibility study or a feasibility study, then, so showing that it's uh, economically extractable, then you don't have a resource but a reserve, and the code for the reserve, approved reserve, is 111, and the code for a probable reserve is 121 or 122. So for mining, you need 111, 121, or 122 uh, as a mineable reserve. A mineral resource estimation is done based on a database with detailed and complete information on the geochemical values of the mineralization, so the assay values, and the intervals of the mineralization, the true drilling intersections, and other relevant data like the specific weight, which is of course uh, very relevant to estimate a tonnage. And the information is gained mainly or only by detailed drilling as well as logging, sampling and analyzing of the drill course. During a mineral resource estimation, geostatistics are used. Uh, in comparison to conventional statistics, geostatistics have a slight difference and these differences are shown here. Conventional statistics are assuming a normal distribution of samples, whereas the geostatistic uh, is also assuming a normal distribution of the samples. Uh, conventional statistics uh, uh, assume spatial relation of samples is not considered, but in geostatistics there is a spatial relation of the samples. And in conventional statistics uh, they do only allow quantification of a global estimation error, variance, standard deviation for example. And geostatistics allows for the quantification of spatial estimation of errors. So the spatial relationship is the main difference to, from geostatistics to conventional statistics.
The conventional mineral resource estimation process comprises the definition of the geological model, so for example the mineralization boundaries, a statistical analysis of the sample data, so the mean, the standard deviation and the confidence level, a conversion of the geological model into a volume model composed of blocks with a certain size, uh, the application of a suitable grade interpolation technique for blocks, for example triangle or polygonal, the assignation of grades to each block, and then the combination of all blocks to a total mineral resource. And finally, the conversion of the mineral resource to a mineral reserve by a feasibility study. Here are some uh, conventional methods of mineral resource estimating. Conventional methods uh, can use A ISO patches, so uh, levels uh, with the same height of something, B polygons or triangles, you can see in C. A very popular method is, of course, cross sections. Can be, you can illustrate these cross sections uh, quite, quite well. Uh, you you see a certain f surface of the mineralized area and you see the surface on the right and on the left hand side and you can take half the distance to uh, interpolate between these cross sections and calculate um, the tonnage of a mineral resource and uh, point E is a random stratified grid. Here's an example uh, of a variogram. Variograms are um, used in geostatistics in mineral resource estimation and the variogram provides a description of how the data are correlated with distance and uh, variograms include the number of point pairs a certain distance apart, the data value at site X and the data value at site X plus the distance h. Uh, you need at least 30 samples to do a proper variogram, variogram and the estimation is restricted to the distance h no more than half the sampling distance in one direction. This sounds complicated but I will uh, give you an example on the next slide. Here you see an idealized uh, variogram uh, with the components one is the sill, the sill is C plus uh, C zero, this is a distance H in uh, meters. Uh, C zero is the nugget effect so you will not be able to have no variance between two points so the certain variance is always given and uh, the range A is the distance over which samples show a spatial relation. So in the mineral deposit the samples do have a spatial relation because uh, uh, this area is the mineralized area and if you are outside of this mineralized area outside the range A you, you have a very high variation and no spatial relation. On the left hand side you have until 500 meters distance you do have a spatial relation on the right hand side the distance is too far from the core of the mineral uh, deposit and there's no more spatial relation. In this case you can see uh, the calculation of a variogram along the main axis of a mineral deposit. The axes are called X, Y and Z in all three directions and the three variograms have the same sill C, the, the height of the sill is the same, indicating um, uh, different vari variabilities in the three directions X, Y and Z of the mineral uh, deposit. That means that the spatial relation in the X axis is far shorter compared to the spatial relation in the Z axis. So the mineral deposit will not be round or cubic but more elongated into the Z axis in this case. The complexity of a mineral deposit is also directly uh, related to the variation of the deposit. 
Uh, in this case, you have uh, four different types of uh, minerals. You have coal seams or chrome seams uh, on the bottom left, in the middle, Mississippi Valley type deposit, and on the top right, shear zone gold, and in the bottom right, kimberlites. Uh, the difference of these um, ore bodies or classes of, of mineral deposits is on the one hand side increasing grade of variability on the left hand side and on the x-axis increasing geological complexity. Uh, whereas a coal seam is, has a very low geological complexity, it has also a very a uh, low variability in grade, in thickness. It is very, very uniform. So you have a spatial relation, and when you are outside the coal deposit, the variation is very high. If you uh, move to Mississippi Valley type, the spatial relation uh, is not as big uh, as for a coal seam. The C0, the nugget effect, uh, is far higher. And on the top, if you have a shear zone gold, there is a very, very high variability in grade from one point to the other. That means on a variogram, it is very difficult or not possible uh, to show a spatial relation because the, the different points can differ uh, very much on a very short distance. And uh, on the bottom, you can see the increasing geological complexity, whereas a coal seam or um, a salt seam is uh, very, very simple in, as a geological structure. Um, in the middle, in the Mississippi Valley, you have, you have more faulting. And uh, on the right-hand side, you have absolutely deformed uh, uh, veins and almost unpredictable uh, uh, grades uh, due to the um, geological complexity, and this transfers to the increasing great variability in shear zone gold deposits. Kimberlites, on the other hand side, also have a high, uh, very high increasing, uh, a very high geological uh, complexity, but uh, the great variability is relatively homogeneous. On this uh, var Riogram, you can again see the range of the influence of the mineralization that is uh, reached uh, where the si when the sill uh, goes goes flat. The samples on the right hand side, uh, separated by these distance, are not spatially related. On the left hand side, this, uh, the samples are spatially correlated. There is a correlation of one sample to the other. And uh, the lower the uh, variability is, the lower the value of the variogram, um, the higher uh, is the geological information you have of your uh, mineral deposit. And that is why on the left-hand side, the samples on the left-hand side can be um, assumed to be a measured resource in the middle, it's indicated. On, on the right-hand side, it's uh, an inferred resource or not even a resource because the variability of uh, the results is that big. Here you can see an example of a variogram of a mineral resource. Uh, on the left-hand side, there is a high spatial relation of uh, the drill holes so the data is spatially correlated and on the right hand side uh, this uh, spatial uh, correlation uh, is getting uh, diminished it's getting less and less until uh, you reach this red line which is the range of influence of the mineralization and all data on the right hand side of this red line does not have a spatial uh, relation and the higher the spatial relation is, the more predictable is the ore grade and the ore thickness uh, of this particular part of the ore body. And that is why on the left hand side, where you have a high spatial relation, you have a measured resource. And going more to the right hand side, uh, this, uh, 
knowledge about the ore body is decreasing and that is why um, this part of the ore body is only an indicated resource and when you've reached the sill of this variogram uh, you might still have intersects of interesting grades of uh, mineralization but one drill hole is not related spatially related to the neighboring drill hole and that is why you can at a maximum say this is an inferred resource or you may not even say that you can only say that there is a mineralization but you cannot call it a resource. Krigging is another method that is applicated uh, in geostatistics and mineral resource estimation. And the great interpolation for blocks of certain size is done uh, by Krigging. Uh, Krigging is a linear regression method for an optimal spatial estimation. And by Krigging, uh, you have a mean and a minimum standard deviation for each block and especially here including blocks which do not have a sample value so including blocks which were not drilled and the method uses a search radius based on the variogram data and it applies weighing of values based on co uh, variance and correlation of distances between the samples and by doing this, you can combine all blocks to a mineral resource and the calculation of the mean and standard deviation of the total mineral resource is done by the sum of the means, standard deviation of the blocks and number of blocks. Here's an example how Krigging works. Uh, in this case, uh, you have uh, three samples with a known value. These values are given in blue and they are 20, 32 and 5. And more or less in the middle of them you have a block uh, without a sample value. But you can calculate the value of this block. And it's not a simple mean of the value 20, 32 or 5. Um, something else is applied and this is a weighing yeah, the weighing of course uh, depends on the distance uh, of the sample value you know from the block. So the sample value 20 has a weighing of uh, 0 0.23. Uh, the sample value 32 has a weighing of 0 0.31, and the sample value 5 has a weighing of 0 0.46. All the three, in this case, three weighing factors sum up to one at the end. And by applying this, like 5 times 0 0.46, 32 times 0 0.31, and 20 times 0 0.23, you get a value, in this case 16.7, with a standard deviation of 2.33. And that is how the Krigging uh, method works for blocks from which you don't have sample values. Uh, today computer-aided mineral uh, resource estimations are done. Uh, typical software can be Serpac, Vulcan, Datamine or, or other. And uh, these, the models uh, these uh, software is using is based on Krigging and this is uh, including all the data uh, you have uh, produced by drilling and geochemical analysis and the computer software is then producing uh, a block model of a mine um, with, a, with, with a certain blocks having uh, a certain grade which uh, can be seen here. The blue um, blocks have a very low grade and then it's going green, yellow, red and to uh, pink with a very high grade and then it has to be uh, uh, considered um, which blocks are mined first in order to get um, high cash flow in the beginning to get a new good uh, or optimum net present value for the mine. So if you have a mineral deposit in the ground, you have to drill it. 
by drilling you get uh, assay values of not only every drill hole but probably every meter of every drill hole uh, that allows you to calculate the mean value, the standard deviation and the confidence interval and by having this you can assign grades to each block and you can do that by hand but usually this is done by computer models but I think it's important uh, to know the basics um, about how these calculations are done. And I'm quite sure you already know that, but uh, just to make sure, uh, the mean value uh, is uh, calculated by summing up all values that are available divided by the number n of the values. That gives you the arithmetic mean. The standard deviation is the measure of the dispersion of values of a population around the mean and is, it is calculated s is the root of 1 divided by n minus 1 times the square of all differences from a value minus the mean value. So x1 minus the mean, x2 minus the mean, xn minus the mean. And these differences have to be squared and uh, then be calculated according to the formula given on uh, the sheet. The confidence interval is used to indicate the reliability of an estimate and is always qualified by a particular confidence level like 90% or 96% which is uh, 2 sigma. The confidence interval is on both sides of the graph so it's plus and minus the standard deviation times the factor of the confidence interval divided by the root of n. If you take the graph on the right hand side, uh, the confidence interval is 90% uh, and that means that 90% uh, of the values or of the area of the graph are between the points minus 1.65 and plus 1.65. Six, five. So 90 percent of all the values are between minus 1.65 and plus 1.65. Decrease the confidence interval uh, let's say to probably plus minus 1.0 you automatically also reduce the confidence level that would not be 90 percent as shown in this example, but it would be lower. I don't know how much. In this case, probably only 60%.
what you can see here is the plan view of a soil anomaly and this uh, soil anomaly is supposed to be tested uh, by drilling on different sections and uh, we will focus on section D. Section D uh, has an outcrop in the in the north end. The deposit is dipping to the south east. Uh, so uh, the, we will have a look on the drill holes A3, A4 and A5 and then on the next slide I will show you how to calculate uh, the tonnage uh, based only on this section D. So this deposit has been uh, drilled on sections, so on, on lines, which uh, one line you can see here. Uh, so resource calculation will be based on cross sections along these lines. And every cross section has an area of uh, influence and this influence is corresponding to half the distance to the next cross section. And additionally every drill hole also has an area of influence which is corresponding to half the distance to the next drill hole or in this uh, uh, case also to the next outcrop. To calculate the surface of the different blocks you have to, in this case, we take an example, we take DDH A4, so you have the uh, width of uh, the intersect, which is 27 meters, and you take half the distance to the uh, drill hole DDH A3, and half the distance is 50 meters, and you also take uh, half the distance to the drill hole DDH A5, which in this case is 45 meters. So you add 50 and 45, which is 95, and then you multiply uh, 95 times 27, and that gives you uh, the surface of the uh, block 3. When you've done that, for all four blocks on this uh, section, you sum uh, up the area, uh, the surface area of this section, and now you have to uh, multiply the result with half the distance to the next cross section on the west and half the distance to the next cross sections on the east, which in uh, this case both is 50 meters. So you uh, have the, your surface uh, results in square meters and multiply uh, this with 100. Finally, you have to multiply uh, the volume which uh, you have now with a specific density of, uh, of the ore, which can be given in 4 grams per cubic centimeter or 4 tons per cubic meter. So you take the surface, multiply it with 4 in this case, and this gives you the tonnage of your resource on this particular cross section. And you're doing this for every cross section you have add up all the tonnage you have and this finally gives you the ore tonnage for your resource.